All right. Hi, everyone. It's your favorite presenter as compared to Greg and Nazir. No, very biased towards me. Um, it's okay. You can admit it, too. Um, today, we'll talk about uh, paralytics. Um, so, in talking about paralytics, you have two broad classic categories of paralytics. You have depolarizers and non-depolarizers. So, so depolarizers here, I'm just going to say depol to make it brief. And for depolarizers in America, we only use one drug, so it's succinylcholine. And you'll quickly learn that I can't spell, so succinylcholine, that'll have to be the picture that in your mind, right? Um, and then there's non-depolarizers. And then for these, the most common ones we'll talk about are Nimbex, which is cisatricurium is another name for it. We'll talk about rocuronium. We'll talk about vecuronium. And we'll briefly mention pancuronium. And those are probably the ones that you'll see. So let's start off on succinylcholine, what you need to know about sucks. And I'll give you everything that like any anesthesiologist knows like the back of their mind, yeah, had a hand about succinylcholine. So let's start with just reviewing what the typical nerve looks like. So this is a nerve, and this structure here, which is a neuromuscular junction. So here's your nerve, and within your nerve here, you have acetylcholine. And then across this synaptic cleft here, you have what's called a nicotinic muscle receptor. So a nicotinic muscle receptor. So how does this work? This works to where you'll have an impulse, and calcium will come into the presynaptic neuron here, and uh, that calcium here will then cause the acetylcholine to come across, interact with the nicotinic muscle receptor, and then sodium will come in, and then eventually when the nerve uh, repolarizes, potassium will come out. Now, to stop this process, acetylcholine needs to be eliminated. And how acetylcholine is eliminated here in the neuromuscular junction is with acetylcholine esterase. And that's normal. So, what's succinylcholine? So succinylcholine is basically just two acetylcholine molecules stuck together. That's all it is. However, an interesting happens when you put these two acetylcholine molecules together with this bond. And that is, is that acetylcholine esterase cannot break this down because the bond impairs its ability to break down. So now you have succinylcholine come into this junction here. You have a contraction, but then instead of the milliseconds of me just contracting my biceps and it relaxing, I can't do that. So now it's going to contract and it's going to stay up. How long it's going to stay up for? It's going to stay long as long as that uh, succinylcholine is in the area. How long does that take? What has to happen here is that succinylcholine now needs to leave this junction and go into the blood where there's a different enzyme called pseudocholinesterase. And it's where pseudocholinesterase here is where succinylcholine is broken down. This whole process on average can take about five to 10 minutes or so in normal healthy people. Um, and then I'll talk about people who might have different genetic variants who could take a little longer, okay? So, this is how it works. This sounds great and everything, right? Now, just keep in mind that when I'm going to deliberately contract my arm, I'm just contracting my biceps and that's it. So, sodium's coming into my muscle to contract and potassium leaves. When we give succinylcholine, every single muscle in your entire body contracts and then releases potassium. And so, in normally giving succinylcholine in a healthy person, you can easily increase your potassium by 0.5 deliquivalents in the bloodstream. This becomes important because if you have a patient with a high potassium already of 5 or 5.5 or 6 and nothing else is going on and you give succinylcholine, you could kill them. I've seen it uh, and it happens. This is one reason why in critical care units that are ran by anesthesiologists, you're not allowed to use succinylcholine in the ICU. And I'll talk about that a little more. So knowing this, this is like normal, everything's going fine. There's some pathology that we need to discuss. And that pathology we discuss is in three separate diseases, but they all have the same pathophysiology. So I'm gonna mention all three and then explain why they're related. So I'm gonna talk about how you never use succinylcholine NY in someone who is paralyzed. And here I'm going to say paralyzed for greater than 24 hours, and you'll see why that is. In someone who has third-degree burns, 
And this is the hardest one, and this is why we just don't use it in the ICU, in anyone who has critical illness, so ICU related critical illness neuropathy. This last one is the kicker, because you kind of never know how long it takes for someone to develop. And I guarantee you, we have at least someone upstairs I can think of right now. I guess I shouldn't put any names on this video. But I guarantee you someone upstairs has it right now. Okay. Four. I guess we can say that. <laughs> we can say that, because it's not, it's, it doesn't no. violate their All right. HIPAA. All right. So um, let's... What about, what about allergies that result, that put them at risk for uh, hyper, uh, uh, malignant hypothermia? Yeah, you're too good, you're too good. All right. Sorry, I went ahead. Karen, we can't invite her to these lectures. <laughs> All right, um, she gets too ahead. All right, so let's, let's talk about, let's finish up talking about these three and then we'll, we'll get to what Karen was mentioning here. Now, I'll repeat the question, okay. So these, why are these three illnesses the same, right? So let's look at it like this, right? If you have your muscle, and here it is, it's this huge long thing, and you have, I don't know, George Small, so you can't see it on purpose. You're gonna have this one little, neuron, neuromuscular junction here for this entire mu muscle. That's what you get. That's all you need to contract that whole muscle. So what I'm trying to draw in an exaggerated fashion is you have very few neuromuscular junctions for an entire muscle. Now when I blow this up, you'll recall that you have these nicotinic muscle receptors only in the area of the neuromuscular cleft. You don't have it the rest of the muscle. But what happens if you get paralyzed? When you get paralyzed, you lose this nerve. What does the muscle need to live? The muscle needs to contract, it needs acetylcholine. So the muscle starts to freak out when it no longer gets acetylcholine from the nerve. And what does it do? It starts to de-anchor these nicotinic muscle receptors and they propagate throughout the entire muscle. So whereas you had extraordinarily few of these receptors, now you have them all over the place. So whereas before, when you were healthy and you gave succinylcholine and you only had a few nicotinic muscle receptors and the potassium only went up by 0.5, in a paralyzed person with this many nicotinic muscle receptors, your potassium will go up by 5. Yeah. Not 0.5, 5. This is a clean kill. Um, someone will go into asystole, done. You're not going to get them back. You know, this is like prison level, like potassium level, you know, lethal dose. Um, now. Critical illness myopathy is the same thing. There is no difference for the body to whether you sever the nerve entirely or the nerve is just not working because you're lying there, you're not doing anything. The muscle still is going to atrophy and die. The muscle doesn't want to die. It'll still propagate throughout the entire muscle. So it's the same thing for critical illness myopathy. The thing that drives us crazy is that we know it takes about 24 hours for this phenomenon to occur in a paralyzed patient. Um, however, we just, we're not very good at knowing who will develop critical illness myopathy and at what point was someone in the ICU for two days, three days, were they moving enough, was physical therapy working, you just don't know. And so you could run to their bedside and use succinylcholine in that patient and have no idea that they're in this state and you can kill them. And I've seen it happen. Um, so the last one is third degree burns. Now remember that a third degree burn is a full thickness burn that goes down to the muscle. And so what happens here is that, in essence, when it goes down to the muscle, you're burning away the nerve. So it's like a localized paralysis. And when the muscle regr regrows, it has no nerve again, so you get this same phenomenon here. Um, okay. So succinylcholine, to repeat, in paralyzed patients more than 24 hours, so that you can start getting this process going. In patients with ICU-related critical illness myopathy or on third degree burns, Really bad idea. Um, all right. Now, I told you that succinylcholine will wear off in about five to ten minutes. All right. So, when you look at the uh, the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, um, it's created by two different. Um, uh, you have two genes in your body. So when you have two genes that make this same acetylcholinesterase enzyme. You can have two genes that produce a normal, so a normal, normal. So this is called homozygous normal. And if you have two normal enzymes that break down, uh, silicone, uh, silicone esterase normal enzymes, they'll break down in five to 10 minutes. You could have 
one abnormal and then one normal. So this would be heterozygous normal. If you have this, the one still does the lion's share of the job, but instead of breaking down in five to 10 minutes, you'll break down maybe in like 15 to 20, something like that. Or you could have homozygous abnormal. So you can have abnormal, abnormal. This is the one we hate. Because for this one, now it's going to break down in more like four hours. So it happens to anesthesiologists. We use succinylcholine because it breaks down quick. So say we have a quick case in the OR, we just want to be out really quick, so we give sucks because we think we're being you know, time efficient. All of a sudden, patients will start waking up and we're like, really, today's my day? Correct. Today's your day. And this happens a lot more common than what you think. So heterozygous abnormal is about 1 in 400. Homozygous abnormal is 1 in 1,600. When you think of 1 in 1,600 and you think like succinyl colons being used every single day in the state of California throughout every OR, this is happening every single day because there's probably 1,600 surgeries today. So it's happening one time today in the state somewhere. So it happens. Um, now, where you two want to know, just so you've heard this, and I'm not going to explain this one in depth, I don't think it's important. If you would want to know whether or not someone has one of these abnormal enzymes, you might see what's called the dibucane uh, um, study. A dibucane um, is a local anesthetic, and we can add this to a pool of this plasma, and it'll somehow magically tell you, I'll just say that, whether or not you have a normal heterozygous abnormal or homozygous abnormal enzyme. Just so you've heard the word dibucane study. You've heard it. All right. Um, now, the last area um, to not use succinyl choline is if someone has a history of malignant hypothermia. So there's two entities, don't be confused by it, right? We're talking about there's malignant hyperthermia and then there's neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is related to things like Haldol and your atypical uh, antipsychotics and things like this. Um, malignant hyperthermia is more of an anesthesia related phenomenon. So malignant hyperthermia is, you'll remember here that you have your muscle and then within the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you have calcium. So here it is. And calcium comes out, and your muscle contracts, and then it goes back in. What happens when calcium comes out and it doesn't go back in? It's a bad story. Your muscles never stop contracting. Your muscles then are your primary source of heat, and then you literally heat up. And that's malignant hyperthermia, and this is what happens. And so our job in malignant hyperthermia is to, one, prevent it in the first place. This is why I'm talking about this for suctional choline. And then, two, you have to treat it to get the calcium back in. There are a few things that we know that can trigger malignant hyperthermia in someone who is genetically susceptible. So they usually have a family history of this. And one of those things is suctional choline. Uh, another one uh, of these items is going to be any of the volatile anesthetics that we use downstairs. So if you look at an anesthesia record, and it says isoflurane, uh, desflurane, uh, sevoflurane, or halothane, or something like that, you're predisposed, along with some. So that's just, at least you heard it once. Um, I don't know why we don't use volatile anesthetics here in the States for a station upstairs next to That's a different story. We use it in Europe. So, um, all right. So um, let's turn our attention now to the other categories, which are the non depolarizers so let's redraw, this time a little bigger, so we can see it a little better here. Let's redraw our nerve, and then our nicotinic muscle receptor, and that same nicotinic muscle receptor here, and then our same friend, acetylcholine, the, tap, the calcium that comes in, and how all the magic happens, right? Except for now, when I talk about a non-depolarizer, now, succinylcholine is called a depolarizer for a reason, because it literally depolarizes every muscle in your body, and then since everything depolarized, you're just dead, literally, and you just kind of lay there flaccid paralysis, right? So non-depolarizers make you flaccid, but not by contracting all your muscles in your body. So how do they do that? So let's take a closer look at the nicotinic muscle receptor. And the nicotinic muscle receptor is composed of two alpha subunits. So here I'm just going to divide this and say there's one alpha subunit over here, and another alpha subunit over here. And what happens is, is when you use any of the non-depolarizers, they all work the same. So I'm going to take rock uranium as the example here and then go over each one individually. If you have one rock that is blocking each of these alpha subunits, then when acetylcholine comes out, it cannot interact with this receptor because it's blocked. So this is called competitive inhibition, and this is going to be important because this, if it was non-competitive, you can't reverse it. So 
In competitive inhibition, you can reverse this, and I'll talk about what reversal is. This is how it works. It's not surprising, right? Rocuronium and proper dosages can work in about 30 seconds if you use really high dosages. Um, the disadvantage is, is that it'll last about 20 minutes. Um, instead of your normal succinyl coin, which is 5 to 10 in someone who doesn't have one of those genetic deficiencies. That's important to know because you can use rocuronium in a rapid sequence innovation, but if you can't get the airway, 20 minutes is a really long time to freak out before the patient wakes back up uh, and can breathe. So it's, it's, it's a plus or minus thing. Um, so now let's talk about what happens here. So when this is completely blocked, you can take a nerve twitch stimulator and you can stimulate, say, the radial nerve and you can see if your thumb twitches. If you can't twitch at all, even though you're twitching, that means that all of the alpha subunits are blocked. It's not going to work. You can, twitch, you can stimulate to the cows come home, there's nothing that acetylcholine can do. Eventually, when one of these rocuroniums goes off into Netherland over here and falls off, and you only have one rocuronium on, if you had enough acetylcholine, you can overcome that one rocuronium, kick it off as well, and then maybe have a twitch or so. And that's what you're looking for in the twitch, is, is at least one rocuronium off the alpha subunits where you can outcompete it. You have yep. a question? Right. No, I'm okay. just twitching. Oh. All right. Um, so that's how that works. Now, this is important because now what I want to talk about is the concept of reversal. And so what we talked about was, was that if you have at least one twitch, that means that there's at least some rocuronium off of one alpha subunit, and you, if you had enough acetylcholine, you can outcompete this. So how can you have enough acetylcholine? Well, you remember that we talked about how acetylcholine esterase was the drug that breaks down acetylcholine. So why don't you give a drug that just inhibits acetylcholine? And if you do, acetylcholine esterase, I'm sorry, and then you'll increase the amount of your acetylcholine. That drug is neostigmine that we use most commonly. So there are other drugs that we can use. I don't think it's important to know them, right? That's spelled wrong, by the way. Um, <laughs> there's neostigmine, edrophonium, physostigmine, and pyrotostigmine. But neostigmine is the one that we use most commonly. Just so you've heard of the other ones, or you know, it doesn't have a, you know, you can use a different one if you wanted to. Um, neostigmine will block acetylcholine esterase and increase the acetylcholine, and you'll be able to outcompete. Now, there's a nasty side effect that you can get with any of these drugs, neostigmine, that we all hate. And that side effect is called death. You don't like that. So why can you get death? You can get death because um, you have the uh, SA node and you have the AV node in the heart. And all of these respond to acetylcholine. And so were you, when you give neostigmine, it blocks acetylcholinesterase in the whole body, including the heart. So now all of a sudden the heart has a massive amount of acetylcholine. You're going to break it down. It's not going to be good. So how do we, we use this drug every day, so how do we prevent this from happening? We prevent this from happening by concomitantly giving glycopyrrolate. So glycopyrrolate is an anti-muscurin. So you can give glycopyrrolate, glycopyrrolate, or there's others you can give. You can give scopolamine or you can give atropine. The reason just for you to know why we live glycopyrrolate with neostigmine is because both of these have the same time for breaking down, they have the same half-life. So you never have to worry about one wearing off or the other. Atropine breaks down really quickly, so though you can use atropine, if you gave it with neostigmine, neostigmine will outlast it and you could have bradycardia refractory later on. That's the only reason why we, this is another reason too, but just remember that one. That's why, that's the major reason why. So by giving the glycopyrrolate, you prevent this effect on the heart and you prevent our, our feared complication that everyone hates, right? Um, looks really bad for us. So now that's how they all work. But there's a little particulars about all of them that we should just briefly mention. Um, and that is that uh, for the most part, rocuronium is broken down a little more by the kidney, not so much. Vecuronium is broken down a little more by the liver. Is this kind of clinically significant? I really wouldn't make a decision based on this if someone was like, like you know, end-stage dialysis, really bad or something like that. Even then, you could probably get away with it. It's okay. Um, the big one, really, that only I see is cisatricurium. Cisatricurium. Or Nimbex. So, as we all know, working in the ICU, we have multi-organ system failure. And so people have problems with their kidneys and their liver and on and on, right? And so what if you had a drug that was not broken down by the liver or kidney? It just was broken down spontaneously in a, in a period of time. It's just so fragile. 
and that's NIMBEX. It breaks down by itself in the bloodstream. We have a fancy word for it, just so we can keep our job security, and that's called Hoffman elimination. Um, and that just means that it just breaks down by itself. So that's why we use it in the ICU, because we don't have to worry about you know, all this end-stage organ damage that people usually have. The last one is pancuronium, and whereas I poo-pooed knowing this, because you really not so clinically relevant, you really kind of don't have to know, it's just kind of a subtlety. This one's really important. This one's like 99% broken down by the kidney. And were you to give pancuronium in someone who has like a GFR of like 10, like 10% or something like that, this drug will last around for like four days. I mean like a long time. So it's like definitely a no-no in that one case. Just for that reason, people rarely use it. Um, we also used to avoid it because of its cardiac effects. Sure. In somebody who's got already cardiac disease. Sure. People can be very sensitive. You can get like bradycardic uh, with uh, with pancreatic administration. Tach Absolutely. Got tachycardic too. Um, and tachycardic. Vol you know, variable heart rates. Um, and I think that's all you need to know for for the paralytics. And I'll I'll stop uh, there. Any questions for our I do. It's, audience? <laughs> yeah. it's a, not entirely related, um, except that it has to do with calcium channel. So calcium channel blockers in either case, but in particular for with succinyl choline, um, some added danger with the use of them? So I'm going to say, okay, so the question was, uh, do you have to worry about calcium channel blockers in the paralytics? I'm going to say no. Um, it's like such a, it's more of a theoretic concern and people haven't really pinned down anything um, for it to be a problem there. So for the most part, no. Not, not, not enough frequency to even talk about. Steroids, however, is a different story. And so there is concern, and it's mostly like in the medical population. The anesthesia population doesn't really do this so much. But there is some data in the medical population that someone who's on steroids and then you give paralytics, you can have an augmented response to the paralytics. And when we normally paralyze people for, say, 48 hours in ARDS, if they were concomitantly on steroids, you have an increased risk of them having critical illness myopathy when they wake up, just that flash of paralysis. Um, I personally have only seen one case of that, and I, I always use paralytics and steroids. But You'll hear about that in the literature, and it's, it's common for steroids. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.